Welcome to week three of Remote Sensing Training, Methods and Best Practices, hosted by NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, also known as RSET. This week's presentation and discussions will be online trainings. I'm Elizabeth Hook, RSET's Communications and Technical Writer and Editor, and today's other presenter is Brock Blevins, RSET's Training Coordinator. This is the last week of this three-part training series. Week one provided an overview of methods and best practices for trainings, including getting started with mission statements, figuring out how your trainings can meet end-user needs, and how you can assess those needs, how to promote your trainings, and how to put together good presentations. Week two focused on on-site trainings, looking at how to develop them, how to structure an in-person remote sensing training, how to develop case studies and hands-on exercises, and program evaluation. If you missed a week or want to review, the recordings for both of those are posted on the RSET website. We have also made available the scripts that the trainers use to present the trainings. They are not word-for-word -word transcripts, sometimes we go off script, but they are relatively close. This week, we'll be discussing online trainings, training levels, and how to structure an online training. We'll also go into some of the considerations of when you choose a software and the timeline of producing an online training. Our goal is that after this week, you'll be able to understand the key components needed for developing on-site or online trainings, that you'll be able to conduct outreach to promote your trainings, and you'll be able to develop and deliver effective presentations on remote sensing topics and applications. We've been presenting these methods and best practices within a framework of seven steps to a successful remote sensing training. We covered the first five steps in week one and steps five through seven for on-site trainings last week. This week, we're going to go into steps five through seven developing, conducting, and evaluating for online trainings. To do that, we'll begin with an overview of what an online training is, its different levels, and the structure of online trainings. We'll go through some considerations for software to host online trainings, an outline of RSET's timeline for producing online trainings and all the materials and deliverables that entails, and then we'll finish with a course summary. There will be a time at the end of this week for a question and answer session. To get started, let's review what an online training is and the differences between on-site and online trainings. As we've mentioned in previous weeks, there are many forms of online and on-site trainings. Last week, we covered on-site and person trainings in depth. RSET has the most experience with the type of on-site trainings held in a computer laboratory over two to seven consecutive days. In these trainings, information is presented using a mixture of lectures and hands-on activities. RSET also offers online trainings just like the one you're taking right now. We typically offer live versions over the internet with the recordings available later for on-demand viewing. Our online webinars are usually offered in series, with each session held once a week for three to five weeks. Each session is typically 60 to 90 minutes and includes some combination of presentations, demonstrations, interactive session, sections, exercises, and homework. When you're deciding between online and on-site trainings, there are several things to consider. Since online trainings are available on the internet, there's no cost associated for travel, either for the trainers or the attendees. One potential cost for online trainings is the cost of the software you use to broadcast the training. Another consideration for resources is the number of staff required. This is highly variable depending on the types of training you're doing the number of attendees you're engaging, and several other things. For online trainings, RSET makes sure that there are at least two hosts at any given time. 
if there's a technical glitch, it means that at minimum, someone else can still be in control of the training. Like today, it also means that as I'm presenting, if someone asks a question, Brock can step in and keep an eye on things. And when he's presenting, I can do the same. But if you're doing a small pre-recorded training, you might be able to get away with just one host in an online training. In terms of audience size, online trainings can potentially have a much wider reach than on-site in-person trainings. This room, for instance, can hold up to 500 people. That's far more than we would ever be able to train in person. But when you're training large groups of people online, it means that there's less individual in-depth interactions with each individual attendee. So if you're looking for an intensive, highly interactive course, on-site might be better than online. Because of this loss of one-on-one -on -one interactivity between trainers and attendees, RSET has also traditionally used online trainings for more introductory level content. The basics of remote sensing, introduction to remote sensing for water resources, etc. It's only been in the last year that we've been exploring ways to do advanced, in-depth online trainings. But even very complex trainings, which may be successfully done on a small scale as an in-person training, just may not transfer well into an online format. So once you look at your criteria and you've decided to go with an online training, what exactly are you thinking about? Online trainings are delivered over the internet. They can be live, on demand, or a mixture of the two. The biggest advantage of online trainings is that they are accessible to attendees wherever they are in the world as long as they have internet access. Online trainings can take several different forms. To name a few, they can be held hourly over the course of several weeks like we're doing now. They can mimic an in-person training and be several hours over several consecutive days. Or they can be self-paced where attendees walk themselves through training material independent of an instructor. Online trainings can, reach, can include a number of different ways to present information, from presentations to demonstrations of data access to question and answer sessions. At RSET, we have participants with a wide range of backgrounds access our trainings. That means that some people come to our online trainings with no experience in remote sensing, and some come very familiar with remote sensing data. Because of this variety, we take a gradual learning approach. We have found it very useful to leverage online webinars as a way to let our courses build on each other, offering trainings at different levels of expertise. If you have no experience with remote sensing, you can, you can take a Fundamentals of Remote Sensing training. It will cover the vocabulary and basic skills necessary for taking our later basic and advanced trainings, both in person and online. Our set reached a point where we realized the material covered at this level of training was being used over and over again, so we recorded a general fundamentals webinar that people can view on demand. We're also working on making fundamentals webinars for general focus areas like our land and eco-forecasting area, to cover the satellites and sensors that are usually covered in those trainings. So once a participant is familiar with the vocabulary and the satellites and sensors, they can move on to a basic training, which goes into broader applications. For instance, our introduction to remote sensing for conservation management covered training examples of how remote sensing can be used for various conservation topics. But if an attendee wants to dig into how to do a specific application, we also provide advanced trainings. These trainings include more intensive exercises and trainings on specific applications. For example, if you had taken our Introduction to Conservation Management webinar, you could then take our set's advanced webinar on creating and using the normalized difference vegetation index from satellite imagery to learn a much more spec spec 
to learn a much more specialized application. Now that you have the general overview of online trainings and the ways our sets lets our trainings build on each other, Brock is going to take over and talk more about the details of structuring an online training. Thank you, Elizabeth. In these following sections, we will walk through the details of online trainings, their methods of delivery, and timelines that we at RSET have found to ensure a successful training experience. After each topic, we'll once again open up the forums, and I look forward to hearing from you and how your programs address these topics. Before we move on to the variety of ways an online training can be structured, we wanted to cover a couple items one may consider. Many times it will be useful to partner with others in order to provide an in-depth knowledge of certain topics, certain topics that maybe your program may not possess. For instance, we train on many data products coming from new NASA missions and satellites, so it's beneficial, beneficial to have a guest speaker who helped develop these project, products, you know, since they have a more intimate knowledge of the subject. Working with the end user community or stakeholders will go a long way to better know what is actually needed in the field or the real world applications of the remote sensing data. This can be done through pre-training surveys or have those stakeholders help to design the training agenda itself. Since the point of the training being offered online is to enable a larger audience, you may want to consider offering different options to attend throughout the day or the week in order to accommodate many time zones around the world. We try to offer two identical sessions for our online trainings on the day of the training to address this. You may have noticed when you registered, you had the option of session A or B held several hours apart, so hopefully you could find a session that best, best fits into your schedule. Providing transcripts or offering materials in more than one language will be another method to be more inclusive with your audience. Also, how many trainers will be needed? If the training is self-paced or available on demand, perhaps only one person is needed. Other variations of an online training, say like live, like this, may require more staff and uh, that will be specific to your training. So you may have noticed that there are many variations of online trainings nowadays. We generally break these types down into by three key elements. One is the length of the training. Some can be as short as 15 minutes to briefly introduce a topic or to cover a very specific procedure. Others can span days or weeks. This webinar series, for example, is about three to four hours total, but spread out over three weeks in a series. Another key element is the timing of your training. So you can present the training materials in real time, live to your participants. Uh, others can be offered on demand, preset or pre-recorded training. And a final distinguishing characteristic will be how that content will be shared. The online training our set typically conducts would fall into this first category here, sharing slides or demonstrations with an audio presentation, uh, which can be live or on demand. Many online trainings of the self-paced variety or the on-demand type, uh, these, are, these are very common in an asynchronous type fashion. Uh, these are usually provided through a learning management system, such as Storyline. And they're called asynchronous because all the participants have the freedom to log in on their own time to complete the training materials. And they, don't, they don't all have to be at the same time as with a live training. There are also recorded or live broadcasts of an actual classroom where an on-site training is being conducted. And of course, there are a combination of these or more. Uh, the point is there are many uh, types to choose from. Okay, that, that brings us to our first forum period. Uh, so we'd like to hear from you 
on the subject of the types of online training that your program conducts. We have opened up a, a, a chat room here, a chat pod, so please feel free to, to share with the group on the topic of what format of online trainings do you present? For instance, is it a sharing of slides with an audio presentation as you see here today? Do you present in an on-demand or self-paced online module using a, a learning management system? So I just want to kind of gauge the room and see what type of expertise we already have online here. I see a couple answers on self-paced. That's, uh, that's something that we are looking to dive a little bit deeper into in the future for all of our trainings. Do you perhaps broadcast a, a classroom and then make that recording available online for an on-site training that you may have done? Great, I've seen a couple of those too. Um, those are very useful. So we'll give this a little bit of time here. Let everybody, let it be known to the rest of the group, the, the type of, of trainings that they do. Do you, do you prevent a, 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 do you present the training live where the participants have a chance to interact with each other with the with either each other or the trainers and some other items that you might want to include would be maybe the length of trainings um, in, in which you present if you, if you do it live is it a six hour block in which you present throughout uh, a good portion of the day? Or is it a, a one hour session in a series like we do? So we'll give this another minute, please. Uh, thank you very much for your for your answers. I see quite a bit on the self-paced online style. That's something that uh, when we get into a little bit more of the details and uh, the different softwares you use, I'd be very interested to hear about your impressions of different softwares you've seen or used yourself, disadvantages and advantages of those. Thank you. And if you don't currently conduct online trainings, uh, possibly and hopefully, this session will give you some great background information in order to start to implement those. You'll hear of different softwares people are using, different types and different modes, um, and then maybe you can implement them into your own program. So we'll close this in about 30 seconds. If you haven't had a, cha uh, a chance to, to share, that'd be great to uh, take the advantage of this 30 seconds to add in here. But of course, we will once again open this up at the end for you to capture everybody else's replies or get another chance to share during the question and answer period at the end.
This slide shows what we at RSET have traditionally done as far as structuring our online trainings. And here's a sample agenda that illustrates that structure. As Elizabeth mentioned, our online trainings or webinars are offered in a series of 60 to 90 minute long sessions presented live for three to five consecutive weeks. We always include the last 15 minutes or more of each webinar session uh, and we dedicate this to a, a question and answer period. Many of our webinars have sessions at different time of the day to accommodate various time zones and to help augment overall participation. In general, the first week we introduce the training, the topic, and the many applications of the remote sensing data products. In the following weeks, we go deeper into the details of the different data types, the data access options or tools, or methods relating to the larger webinar topic in each week. For example, for those who attended the Water Resources or Advanced NDVI webinar series, these agendas may look pretty familiar to you. After we introduce the satellite missions and models related to the training in week one, the following weekly sessions address subtopics within that topic, such as with the Water Resources series. As you see here, each week cover different elements of the water cycle. Uh, it's data and access. And in the final week of the series, we demonstrate methods to bring them all together and estimate a regional water budget. We did this as well with an advanced webinar series that Elizabeth mentioned earlier, the, uh, the training creating and use a lot, using normalized difference vegetation index, NDVI, from satellite imagery. After giving an or overview of NDVI and an introduction to GIS, the following weeks built off that knowledge. It showed the acquisition of Landsat imagery and deriving NDVI through a GIS. Also doing the same thing with MODIS NDVI and how to create a time series. And finally, how to create a MODIS NDVI anomaly map. Each week with its own focus under the broader topic of NDVI. An online training content is similar to that of an in-person or on-site training. It can be composed of a mixture of lectures, demonstrations. Online trainings can include homework and exercises. If interactive, they can also include time for question and answer periods. And just as with face-to-face -face trainings, it will be used to have, useful to have some method to evaluate the trainings or training experience. For each component, we'll cover some tips we have found to be useful. And when we open up the forum, we'll ask those online to share your thoughts on each one of these components or any ones that uh, you have uh, insight to. So please keep that in mind as we go through these. The lecture portion of an online training. Since this is an online training, since the online training has a potential to be global, it'll be good to keep your audience in mind when putting together and delivering your lectures. This means speaking slower and enunciating your words. Try to use language that's neutral and devoid of idioms so you're not using phrases or words that are only used in certain regions. Don't use offensive phrases or words. Also try to define acronyms and technical jargon. This is important since they might not have the opportunity to ask you questions during the lecture period. Since a lecture or presentation can at times be lengthy, or especially since this is being presented online, your, off, your, your audience may be sitting in front of their computer, it's easy to get distracted with emails or other work, um, so it's, it's important to find ways to keep the participant engaged. After certain topics, give a quiz or a poll to be sure they are following along and comprehending what you just covered. Also, you know, allow time for participants to interact with each other in a forum. This can break up any monotony that can exist, can it exist in a long lecture. And it's a good strategy to try to work in case studies into your lecture. Uh, I think the audience naturally relates to case studies and this provides some context on how to apply the data, the tool, the methods, or whatever they happen to be interested in, in their region.
That brings us to demonstrations or demos. The purpose of demonstrations is to show the sequence of actions or the click by click steps designed to show participants how to navigate these web tools and portals. It may not be intuitive to someone how to use them if, if it's their first time, so it's extremely helpful to demonstrate the features of a portal or tool or method of analysis. We like to show the, the many different options that can be enabled within a web tool or different visualization techniques. Data portal navigation for data access are some of the most instructive demonstrations we give, and they can include how to download or showing the different data format options. And if you want to go a step further, how to import into a GIS. More advanced demonstrations can show the analysis and the application of that data, uh, maybe a step-by-step -step instruction on, for, for offline exercises or examples of running code to perform an analysis on that data. We walk participants through guided exercises of online tools or portals we have demonstrated so they can navigate and process the data themselves. This is more about getting the participants to do it themselves rather than just understanding the lecture. These demonstrations can be a live screen share of a site or it can be pre-recorded. One tip I would like to add here is, even if you do perform a live demo of a tool, uh, it'll be useful to have a recording made ahead of time. That way, if all the participants go on your online tool or portal as you're going live, this, it, it might slow down that site. Um, so this way you'll have a means to present without the, the demonstration itself being affected. Homework and assignments are a good way to evaluate the participants' comprehension of training material and also to reinforce the training content. Instructors must strike a balance between adequately testing knowledge and the ease of evaluating the assignments. And effective assignments include a mixture of multiple choice and short answer questions. Multiple choice or true or false questions are the easiest to grade, but they also limit the ability of the trainer to test the depth of understanding. Short answer questions require a bit more time to check for accuracy since you may have to read each response, but they do provide better insight into the participant's comprehension. You may want to consider a way to incentivize assignment completion. To that end, our set requires participants to submit their homework in order to receive a certificate of completion for the training. Then there is the method in which you collect the homework. We use Google Forms, and this is because it's administered online, um, but it also helps the trainers to easily track completion. Also in Google Forms, you have a way to indicate the correct answers on multiple choice or true or false questions so once the participant submits their homework, they can easily check their score. Question and answer, or Q&A sessions, provide a time when participants can ask follow-up questions to content that was delivered in the lecture, or ask for clarification on various subjects. There are many ways to do this whether they're opened up throughout the training or at the very end, we have found that a, a clear, structured, clear and structured question and answer session is one in which the questions are repeated or reframed by the trainer before answering. And also, if there are multiple trainers online addressing questions particip from participants, it may be helpful to de designate one trainer to take the lead or for the trainers to at least be familiar with each other. So the one who's most knowledgeable on the question subject will know to address that one. These sessions also provide an opportunity for those participants online to network among themselves. For instance, the first text that I put in a Q&A session reads, please feel free to type your questions here. You can also type your name, location, organization, and email address to connect with your fellow remote sensing practitioners. And many participants do so to connect with others of similar interest or focus. 
And finally, this is a prime opportunity for trainers to ask the participants questions, and this can also serve as an additional end user needs assessment. These can be ad hoc questions on the subjects presented that week, or you can ask participants for feedback on their experiences with certain portals or tools if they've used them before, such as how user friendly have you found Giovanni, the Giovanni data portal? Or what services would you like be made available to make available to make data access and usage easier? You can also be, begin discussions with the audience on future topics they would like to see in a training and to get a better idea of how they wish to apply the remote sensing data. We talked about program evaluation in week two for on-site trainings, and this applies to online trainings too. Still want to get feedback. So once again, the goal of program evaluation is to assess the progress towards meeting the learning objectives. How well is your program doing? To assess the impact of the training, are participants making use of what they learn in their jobs or academic study and how? and all together to provide an ongoing means of improving your program. And here are the various tools in which, we, which one can conduct evaluations from surveys to interviews or focus groups. Some additional things to keep in mind when you're doing this in an online setting would be to provide some time at the end of the training for participants to begin a survey. Even if you merely post the URL to SurveyMonkey or your chosen online survey form and ask them to click and open it, the chances they'll complete it goes up. You all may have your own ways to send reminders to fill out the survey, but we at RSET send them one week after the training is completed, and then again a week after that. If you want to evaluate the impact of your trainings, a follow-up six-month survey may be needed. After some, this allows for some time to pass, and they've had some time to really work and apply that data. You may have okay, great. Um, so I just want to open up another forum here. Let me minimize the slide here and get this chat box opened up. <clears throat> So we talked about a few components as it applies to an online training from lectures to homework to demonstrations, question and answer periods, as well as evaluation. So what we'd like to do here is if you have experience in conducting online trainings as it applies to these components, uh, we would love to hear from you and share with the rest of the group your any, any tips you have, um, what has worked well or not worked well for you. Um, and as you answer these, please maybe type in the beginning a little bit, you know, which component in which you are referring to in your reply. And there's quite a bit covered here, so um, we'll give this some time for people to to make their thoughts known. For instance, in your if you provide demonstrations in your trainings, whether it's on demand or in a live setting, uh, what what are some of the techniques that you've used to uh, to do so? Do you include interactive periods in between lectures? Or do you have any certain methods in which you found to keep an online audience engaged as you're giving a lecture? Do you provide homework 
And and if so, uh, what what method do you use to to conduct those homeworks or collect those homeworks? And do you have a method to evaluate those? I see here about um, how homeworks may not have worked out so well in an online training. If you have a an idea of why that might not have worked for you in that particular training, I would like to hear about that as well. I'm sure others online as well. Thank you. Yeah, I see here about uh, limited time during a training. I guess it really depends on how your training is constructed. Since we do a series, we give a, a week in between each series, so it enables us to, to give them time to complete a homework before the, the next session. So multiple sessions is really conducive to presenting homework in between. But I can see if it's a, a, a one-time training, possibly the homework might not fit so well in, in, into that type. But there are ways to at least have a, a follow-up or a way to gauge their comprehension before the, the next training if you move on to, say, more advanced topics. Do you provide time for um, a little bit of end-user needs assessments or evaluation of certain portals or tools in which in which you presented? Do you do you have a way of getting almost sometimes immediate feedback after you presented an exercise or a demonstration? Say you walk through an exercise step by step with 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 your participants. Do you have a way of of gauging their immediate um, um, impression of the usability of that tool. I know some programs will have a a training in which they'll they'll present the lecture and a little bit of work, um, and then have a a question and answer period scheduled sometime in the future where people have a chance to come back and and just have a one-on-one -on -one or a, a forum period with the trainers. That's something we've done in the past as well for our quality trainings. Oh, I like this, uh, some scale of the impacts as far as the different components are concerned, uh, this is a nice little scale here. Thank you very much for this. On a scale of one to five, finding lectures, um, providing a little bit lower, but as you get into the question and answer periods or the demonstrations, it becomes a little bit uh, more effective as impact. Thank you. some good information. Thank you very much for sharing. We'll give this a, a another minute or so. Are there certain online methods in which you um, present your homework? 
as I mentioned, we use Google Forms. Are there any other online ways that, that you've found useful? I see here a comment about uh, do-it-yourself assignments. That might be something that um, uh, falls in the category of, of case studies where you're showing a certain region, a certain case study, but then you open it up for the participants to apply that knowledge to a particular event or a region of their interest in their particular country. It's always a good idea. It really seems to hit home a little bit better if it's a, a topic or a region that's near and dear to them. Okay, so we'll give this another 30 seconds and then we'll move on to the next subject. And of course, we'll open this up at the end again too for you to capture the responses. Thank you everybody for chiming in. In this next section, we're going to talk about the software needed to conduct an online training. The software provides a method to present informative and instructional materials virtually as if the participants were in a seminar room viewing the presentations with you. A variety of software options offer a wide range of capabilities and we won't present on specific software here since there are so many to choose from. They each have their own advantages and disadvantages. However, in the forum, we will be asking you, those online here today, to share the software you've used or, or, and what you found useful about them and why. But here we just wanted to speak on the different features they can provide. So here comes some considerations when using software to present your online trainings. We have found that the ones to be most useful are the ones that provide the ability to broadcast the presenter's slides, audio, and or video. It will provide sufficient capacity in each seminar room or the number of participants that are allowed to log in at any one time. A a really useful software offers a method to manage and track participation, as well as the ability to interact with participants throughout the training process. When using large webinar rooms, we have found it useful to employ a software that includes the ability to manage registrations. This allows trainers to screen the participants that best fit the training learning objectives. The registration information can also be used to adapt the training content to best need the, meet the needs of the participants and inform the development of future trainings. The ability to manage the webinar sessions with a means to send reminders for the training as it approaches is useful. An email client can do this as well, but we find it's nice to have it all in one place within the same software. We find it useful that to have software that features ways to keep participants engaged and to enable interactions. These can include chat boxes or so participants can interact with each other, as well as with the trainers. We can provide polls or quizzes that the trainers can send out instantly to participants during the webinar session. A landline option is 
is a good feature or a telecon option is a good feature if you want to provide audible interaction among the participants and trainers. The ability to automatically, automatically mute microphones is an important feature. Background noise and feedback noise is sometimes unavoidable, and you'll want to have that type of control. Additionally, the ability to record the training is a good feature. Participants' quality of internet connections can vary greatly, and for some participants, poor internet quality will lead to technical difficulties. Instead of watching the live webinars, participants experiencing technical dif difficulties can opt for viewing the recorded webinars on demand. So on the topic. So on the topic of, of software, I'm, I'm curious what's being used out there by those online. So I'm going to, we have a little poll here, actually, if you want to join in. If your program conducts online trainings, are they presented live or on demand or both? And then also in the chat box, if your program conducts online trainings, what particular software do you use? And please indicate along with that if you're using this for live webinars, webinars or an on-demand learning management system. Adobe Connect, that's what we use. That's where, what we're using here today. I see WebEx, that's a, that's a very popular one I've found as well. If you have any insight onto, um, you know, if you are using a particular webinar software, what you find most useful about it, or if you used other softwares, what you found not useful about them and maybe why you, why you switched to another one. Just some advantages and disadvantages. It seems here from the polling that the on-demand seem pretty popular, but also there's some programs, quite a few, that conduct both. And the live seems to be less of a, a method that, that the group here uses. We've noticed that we do that, and there's not a lot of other programs that, that, that do it as much. So the on-demand, I... I I mean, with all the advantages and disadvantages of being able to do an asynchronous type, asynchronous type training, um, that, that is why we're, we're looking into to employing that as well. For the on-demand style. Uh, I mentioned one particular software that I've seen used, and that was called Storyline. But if you conduct on-demand trainings, what software are you using? I know that we as a program at RSET, we would definitely like to know because we're trying to decide which ones to possibly start using. See a question here about open source software. Is anybody using an open source software that you would suggest to the group that you've had success with?
we found Adobe Connect to be a, a really useful one. It has a lot of bells and whistles. It allows you to um, manage registrations, send out email alerts, get full reports on who's logging in and, and, and when. Different softwares have certain capabilities as far as how many people can log into one room at a time. Uh, I saw here, this is more for the, the live style of delivery, but this uh, AVU India, I'm, I'm curious, is, is that an open source or a proprietary software? And if so, is there a limit restriction to the number of people who can log in at once? Certain softwares have an ability to have breakout rooms. Has anybody had any success with certain software where you're allowed to do that, where at the end of a training or even throughout, I guess it depends on how you have it structured, but it allows participants to kind of connect offline and share ideas, or if they're working on a project together online, it provides a space for that. Has anybody had a chance to use anything like that? Um, I'm sure the rest of the group would be keen to hear that. So we'll give this a, an, another minute or so. Thank you. Thank you for posting this about an open source software. I'm not sure how to say the acronym, but T-A-M-S-A-T. -A -A Looks like maybe another one here called Spirits. When we open this up at the end, I, I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about that. So if you have a chance to share some more at the end, uh, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, maybe some things that you found very useful about this software, some of the things that it offers and some things that it doesn't. So we'll move on to the next section here. In this following section, we'll talk about the timelines and the deliverables. This will be similar to the timelines for an on-site, in-person training with some slight alterations. Certainly, given that many difference, differences can exist from one program to another, these timelines can be adjusted. But in the next few slides, you'll see what we at ARSA have found to work in order to ensure a smooth process, on-time delivery of training materials, and addresses the nuances associated with presenting an online training. Assuming you have already determined the topic of the training based off of the needs of your remote sensing and user community, we have found about four to six months before a training is delivered allows for enough time to sufficiently plan and produce an online training. 
And this begins with a preliminary agenda. This four to six month time frame also allows time to gather interest from potential participants. Sending invitations and, and, and the pre presentation guidelines to any guest presenters should begin early to clearly communicate the expected timeline of the materials being delivered, such as their presentation slides. Together, you, you can determine if there are certain regionally specific case studies you plan to present as well. But by three months, it'll be beneficial to have the agenda finalized. Because you're going to want to promote this through your listserv, through emails or social media in the months leading up to the training. And you will want to to clearly communicate the objectives of the training. Try to be explicit in the training learning, projective, uh, learning objectives, and having a finalized agenda helps you to do that. Two months out gives you time to set up your virtual space in which you'll be delivering your, your online training. This, of course, will depend on the software that you're, you're using. But if you plan to handle registration through that software, then a completed web space will be needed. A training web page to point potential participants to is also good practice. And this will communicate the learning objectives. Um, you can include the details on how to register on the web page, when to attend, and any prerequisites you might have. This can also serve as a location for the agenda and the training material you post prior to or throughout the training. For instance, did, did you know that this training has a web space and a web page? We'll post that URL on the chat in case you have not accessed that yet. One month prior, we find this is the time to get all the training materials completed. There tends to be a lot going on during the last few weeks before a training. And if you give live webinars, as we do, if you wait longer to complete the PowerPoint slide, the exercises, and the homeworks, it can easily become overwhelming. One month gives you time to edit sufficiently, translate if you plan to do so, and update any surveys, surveys that you give with the specifics of that training. Given this is an online training, you want to be sure that the presenters are familiar with the delivery software. This includes a knowledge on how to use the software, how to conduct any interactive elements you may include, and most importantly, that their microphone is working properly and clearly. Be sure to test the microphones on the computer they plan to use that day, and as well as in the, the, the room in which they plan to present, um, so you, to be sure there isn't a lot of background noise or echo. Essentially, try to simulate the actual day of presentation as much as possible in these, in these practice sessions. With two weeks to go, try to complete all the training materials and upload those to the training web page and also into the delivery software. Participants may want to review the slides beforehand, so it's good to post those on the website. Also, you might want to find a good method to time your reminders to attend the training. So that brings us to our summary of the week. There was uh, quite a bit to unpack in that one, and we will open this up for question and answer on all these topics. Um, but just as a reminder of what we went through here today, in this final week, we talked about the specifics of conducting an online training from the many different formats and structure to the attributes of the software used to, to deliver the trainings, and a timeline we at RSET have found useful. So to review, we have found that there are seven steps to a successful remote sensing training. 
developing a training mission statement, assessing end user needs, networking and training promotion we covered in week one. We then talked about developing training material, conducting the actual trainings for both on-site and online trainings. And finally, methods we can use to evaluate or assess the impact of our trainings. There was a lot to cover, as we saw from our forums, and many more details we can discuss and learn from each other. So I hope we as a community can find ways to continue these conversations. Uh, for instance, in the question and answer period, we can maybe find ways to keep this conversation going possibly start a wiki or an online forum. If anybody has ways to start this up and invite the rest of the group, uh, I, I encourage you to do so. And as I mentioned earlier, at the end of every training, I this is what I typically write. It's uh, basically a way to encourage those online to get to know each other and share your contact information. A little bit about who you are, what you do, the organization you represent. And this would be a good time to do so. But also in this question and answer period, if there are questions throughout this entire webinar series that you would like us to clarify or expand upon, uh, please feel free to ask. We're, we're here online to answer your questions. There's a lot of topics. I see some people change, uh, setting up some, some uh, contact information. This is great. We didn't have a an open forum forum period as it addressed the timeline that we at our set use as we lead up to an uh, a live webinar series. So if you have any questions about that, or uh, I'd like to hear from you um, some additional items you might add to your timeline that you find that we did not address that are very important to making sure that everything stays on schedule and all the deliverables are met leading up to a training. So if there's other little tips that you include, please share with us and why, why they happen to be useful for you. I see a YouTube channel for remote sensing learning. This, uh, this is something I'm definitely going to check out. Thank you. I posted the survey link here as well in case you get a chance to click on it before and as I mentioned earlier we send a reminder next week and then a final one the week after that that's the method in which we use do you have a way of sending reminders for surveys if you do evaluations for your trainings and what's the timeline in which you send reminders that's ours you'll receive those from me 
If you completed it here, that's great. If you want to take more time with the, uh, your responses, feel free to do that as well. In that survey, we asked a question about what you'd like to see in the future on the subject of remote sensing training best practices. You can answer, please answer in that, but if there's something that you'd like to type, to type into the chat box here, uh, possibly we can talk a little bit about that now. I'm also curious, is anybody involved in a, an offline forum, a Google group of remote sensing training practitioners? Anybody who performs remote sensing capacity building? Is anybody involved in other groups where you discuss best practices? Have you come across other manuals that different organizations have put together uh, addressing this topic? Of note, our, our surveys are anonymous, so when I send the reminders out, if you've already taken them, sorry for reminding you again, um, so if you've already taken it, please disregard the, the reminder emails. Because they are anonymous, I, I can't tell who exactly entered it, so I just kind of send it out to, to the entire group, just so you know. possible some on here are from universities and you train on remote sensing in an academic setting it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about some of the differences in all these different components of online and on-site trainings and how they might differ as it applies to an academic setting You know, I, I am curious, is, is, is there a, an established group right now already of remote sensing pract uh, capacity building um, practitioners, say, as um, a, a union or a, just basically a group of trainers for future discourse? That would be great to, to know about. I'm actually going to bring in some of the, the past forums here. So once again, when we opened up these forums earlier, they were after the topics of the format of online trainings in which you conduct. We had talked about 
you pre present them online or on demand. We also talked about the various components when it comes to conducting a training from the lectures to the demonstrations, different tips that we found useful. And in these forums, there was quite a bit of information as well logged in. And then also on the subject of the online training software. This is a, it's a big topic, actually. I'm curious if in WebEx you're able to have breakout sessions or create an, an, a forum after the training, to exist after the training is concluded for those taking the training to converse amongst themselves. We at RSET very much appreciate your participation in this webinar series. To recap, this is a three-part webinar series sharing the methods and best practices used by the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program here at NASA. But I hope that throughout the forums, you are able to hear from other remote sensing training practitioners around the world from different sectors, different focus, and how they address a lot of the topics that we talked about, the topics of building a remote sensing training program, different outreach methods, ways to deliver your and, and present your quality presentations. So we hope that through this, you're able to understand some of the key steps needed to develop an online or on-site training learning how to conduct outreach and promote those trainings, and how to deliver your remote sensing trainings. These topics can continue for a lot longer, and we hope to do this again. But for this three-part three webinar series, we really thank you for your participation, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you very much.